ready to get started. I'm good. Okay. And Will, are you doing all right? He's having a little trouble with his internet, so we might be able to have him. Can you, can you hear me? We can. Sounds good. All right. Everybody online, thank you so much for joining us for Hatfield's Marine Science Center Research Seminar this afternoon. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I am the Research Program Manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for today. Um, just a few logistics. This is a Zoom platform, but we ask that you keep your video, camera, mics, and screen shares off for the duration of this event. It just helps us um, navigate when we have so many attendees, but we do hope that you interact with us by asking questions. And so you can use the chat box that you find um, by taking your mouse to the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, um, depending on what platform you're using, and you'll find a little chat box uh, pop out um, and you can put in your questions at any time and our speaker today will answer them at the end of our presentation. I wanted to remind everybody that today's event is being recorded. And if you are interested in um, seeing any of our past seminars, um, you are welcome to go to our past seminar page. And I just put that information into the chat box, both for you to practice finding the chat, but also so you can see where that link is at if you need it. Uh, for those students taking today's seminar for credit, Michael Banks is online. You saw his picture here just a few minutes ago. Um, feel free to answer or to put in any questions directly to him. He'll be able to answer them as well. A um, couple little things for next week. Uh, we are not going to have a seminar because seminar would be on a holiday. Um, but I do hope that you join us again on December 3rd. Third, when Eric Archer, who's a marine mammal and um, turtle division researcher at the Southwest Fishery Science Center will be speaking to us. So we're really excited to hear um, from Eric Archer. So that will be on December 3rd. Um, I also wanted to let folks know, if you haven't heard already, we're doing another event right after this one almost. Um, it's our monthly Science on Tap outreach uh, event. And so it is going to be about the new building at Hatfield and the life safety features of the vertical evacuation structure that's built into that building. So if you're interested in learning more about that, either for your personal um, information about your uh, evacuation options at South Beach, um, or just because you're an engineering geek and you want to learn a little bit more about building, um, you're welcome to join us for that. Um, you are able to find information and the links for that on HMSC's homepage. Um, I also just want to little put a little plug out that we are going to continue the um, seminar series virtually, um, at least for now, um, and I'm looking for seminar speakers. So if any of you online um, are interested in sharing with us or you have a collaborator that you want to um, um, share with the Hatfield community, please send me an email and we will connect them and find them a date to be able to share with us. But for today, um, uh, today's speaker was invited by our own uh, Will White. And so Will is gonna do our introduction. Will, come and hand it off to you. Great, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jess Hopp. Uh, who will be speaking to us today. Uh, Jess is a postdoc in my research group. Uh, Jess comes to us from Australia. She did her PhD in 2016 at uh, James Cook University, and her dissertation was all about the uh, short-term effects of protected areas on the Great Barrier Reef on fisheries, especially for things like uh, coral trout, which I should explain to you Oregonians is not actually a trout because Australians like to name things in a funny way. Uh, the coral trout is that uh, handsome fellow in the middle of the screen right now. Um, she then went on and uh, did a postdoc uh, down at uh, RMIT University in Melbourne, uh, going in a different direction, looking at uh, how do you uh, control and manage uh, invasive carp uh, in Australian waterways. And uh, now just this year, she has started uh, working with me and doing a lot of work back in the realm of marine protected areas, uh, starting up a number of projects that are all aimed at informing the statewide reviews of marine protected areas that are happening in uh, Oregon and California in the next few years. Uh, and I think she'll be telling us about uh, some of that. So it's, uh, again, my pleasure to welcome Jess. I should add that uh, because it is 2020, Jess is actually still in Australia. She's in Queensland. Uh, we'd hope to bring her out to Hatfield uh, to get her uh, to meet everyone and experience uh, Oregon in person, but that's just not happening right now. So she's, um, we do a lot of Zooming. Uh, Will, we've lost your mic. Try one more time. Nope. 
We still are unable to hear you, but so I'm just going to um, say thank you, Will, for that introduction um, and the challenges of uh, working over Zoom. Um, I'm sure that both Will and Jess have experienced, but for today, we'll hand it off to Jess. Um, Jess, why don't you take it away? Great. Thanks, Cinnamon and Will. Um, yeah, it's certainly been a bit challenging working over Zoom, but it's definitely been a great learning experience. Um, and I'm really, I feel really privileged to be able to um, work with people that I work with now. So today I'm going to be talking about this general concept of marine protected areas in a dynamic and changing world. And I'm going to be presenting um, some work both from that I did during my PhD. So this is why I've got so many affiliations on the screen now. Um, my PhD was at James Cook Uni um, with Sean Connolly, Jess Jones and Dave Williamson. So I'll just be talking a little bit about work from that that we published last year. Um, and also talking and giving you some tastes of the work that I'm doing now um, with Will at Oregon State, um, also with Jane Cassell and um, working with some data that we've collected from PISCO, um, which is a partner for interdisciplinary studies of coastal oceans. Cool, so let's get started. Um, so in the past 15 years, we've seen a pretty dramatic increase in the proportion of our world's oceans that's been designated as protected or spatially protected. And today we see about 8% of, of our oceans within some form of marine protection. A smaller portion of that, about 3%, is designated as no-take areas. So these are areas where no extractive or destructive human activities are allowed. And we commonly refer to these areas as reserves. So when I talk about reserves, or sometimes I might accidentally slip in MPA, um, I am talking about the no-take areas specifically. Um, so this is the work that I'm going to be revolved around these types of NPAs and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So a really core concept behind reserves is that by protecting areas from these um, exploitative activities, we're allowing populations, um, especially populations of um, targeted fish or targeted species, we're allowing those populations to recover. Um, and thereby achieving conservation goals, such as supporting species persistence, uh, protecting natural biodiversity, and encouraging areas with intact ecosystem functions. And significant work has gone into demonstrating this. So in general, we see that biomass density and the average size of individuals uh, is greater within reserve areas compared to a reference point outside or before. And furthermore, um, through the connectivity between reserves and the outside areas, these benefits that we see can potentially be exported to promote sustainable fisheries um, and help conserve populations at a network-wide scale. So when assessing the effects of the reserves, there's really been two key approaches. One of them has been more of a theoretical approach, asking the question of uh, what can we expect after we establish a marine reserve? And a lot of this theory has been informed by modeling studies. So these are studies where you're converting biology into mass and using that to ask questions about the system and explore scenarios. So the great thing about these studies is that we can explore these scenarios without actually going out and manipulating the system or waiting for ages for the responses to happen. The other great thing is it allows us to attribute causation so we can actually find out what are the mechanisms that are driving the results that we see. But on the flip, flip side, um, modeling studies are often reliant on the assumptions that we make. So the assumptions we make in converting ecology and um, biology into math um, can influence the results that we see. The other downside, well not downside, but caveat is that the modeling studies, especially in MPA and fisheries world has focused on long-term conditions. So these are conditions that we run the model out to some sort of equilibrium and we look at what happens. Although I'll talk about it in a minute, um, this is shifting. The other side of the um, coin, we see um, empirical data approach. So what are we actually seeing when we go out and look at what's happening? And these are generally informed by your monitoring and your survey studies. And the really fantastic thing about this is that we can actually explicitly document what is going on. We can see the response and um, see what has happened. The flip side is that these responses are subject to external factors, and this can make it really challenging 
to attribute causation and isolate the mechanisms behind what is actually driving the trends that we see. So I work a lot in this theory space. I'm an ecological modeler. And a lot of my focus is around how we can better align the theory with this empirical data. And this is really, really important because we need to understand whether what we are seeing matches what we can expect to see. And if it doesn't, then we can start to ask questions around, is it our management actions that aren't actually working? Or is there something we're not capturing in our monitoring programs or are we missing some sort of key knowledge about the system um, that would help better inform our theory? Or is there some sort of large issues at play that are overriding marine reserve effects? Um, so I think climate change, for example. So one of the key questions really needed to better link this theory with the data um, is what are the expected short-term trends that we can see after we implement a marine reserve? And we, we being the um, collective research community, have really started to make some progress on this. So we can think about marine reserves as systems that have been perturbed by the um, by change in management action, namely putting in a, in a spatial protected area. And how the system responds to this change can depend on a couple of things such as fishing pressure, um, as well as life history traits. Um, consequently, the dynamics that we see in these few years after we establish a reserve are not necessarily going to match what we see in the long term. So it's really important to continue to ask this question of what can we expect to see in the short term. And leading on from this is the question of how likely are we to see these effects, given all the stochasticity and the craziness of biological systems. And this has direct relevance to monitoring and assessing reserves, because while we might expect to see something um, it might not actually come out as, cl as clearly in our empirical data and, and we can ask questions about why that might be. And I'll explore this a bit more for the first half of my talk. So one of the first slides to really link our expectations of what we observe, um, Nichols et al developed a blue rockfish population model to test the efficacy of reserves in the central California coast. So I'm going to specifically talk about Point Lobos today. So when they used the base model assumptions, they found that what they're expecting from the model, so this is the this line and the shaded area in these two, uh, these two lines, um, what they found they expected did not match, necessarily match what we saw in reality. So that's the point here. And the reason for this is that the initial size distribution used in the model, um, which is the blue line, was vastly, dif dif vastly different from the actual size distribution that was observed in blue rockfish at the time that the reserves were established in that area. So that true distribution kind of had more, um, more fish in the middle age classes, whereas the assumed one had more fish in the smaller age classes. So when accounting for this actual size distribution, um, they found that um, what was expected based on the model better matched what we saw in reality. And then they could have more confidence in being able to project the model further in time and look at the future of blue rockfish in the reserve. So the question is what drove this difference between these two distributions um, and what caused these initial expectations to be so different? And the reason that we see, one of the reasons we can kind of see this squishing into the older age classes is due to our recruitment failures or poor larval supply into the population in the years preceding um, when you take the, the distribution, when you sample the distribution. So we wanted to explore this idea more and look at the general consequences of this for reserves. So we're gonna change species a little bit um, and location. So this, it, to answer this question, we looked at kelp bats in the Channel Islands and we use SMRF monitoring data. Um, so admittedly, because I haven't been over to the US yet, I haven't actually seen this system, um, but I'm told that these kelp bats look pretty cool. So hopefully one day. So SMRF monitoring data, are, oh, sorry, SMRF are standard monitoring units for reef fishes, and they're essentially devices that are really attractive to fish larvae and that allow us to count how many larvae arrive at a given site over a period of time. And so if we look at the data for the Channel Islands area, 
um, we can see that there's clearly good periods of larval arrival and clearly periods is not so good. And a bad year happened to, did happen to coincide um, with the time that the MPA was established. And the other thing to note is that the peaks in the good years seem to occur at a semi-regular basis. Um, so we can actually test this formally to see if there's some sort of pattern going on in the arrival of larvae. And the way we do this is using something called a spectral analysis. And the really basic thing to know about spectral analysis is that they provide an indication of how much variance there is at certain um, periods in time. So we can test this variance against a random red noise spectrum to determine whether the peaks that we see in variance um, are actually significant or not. And we chose to do use a 0.05 threshold for this. And we found that there is an approximately six year and two year periodicity. So what this means is that there's a major peak in the larval arrival roughly every six years and a minor peak roughly every two years. So we know that this periodicity is going on, there's something happening and we've quantified that. And next we wanna ask is what are the implications that this has on um, the dynamics that we see in reserves after we, it, sorry, the dynamics that we see in populations after we establish a reserve. And what implications does this have for when we're actually going out and monitoring and assessing um, marine reserves? So to answer this question, I just wanna take a step back and I'm gonna talk about the general metapopulation model that I use, because I use it through all the studies that I'm talking about today. So if we get a good handle on it now, it'll, it'll save time later on. So what we use is called a metapopulation model. And the basis for this is an age structured model, um, which captures the different demographic rates among ages. So it captures things such as survival and growth um, as the fish age. You can also have it as a, as a stage structured model as well, or a um, size structured model too. Um, and it also captures the contribution of age classes to uh, new members of the population, which in this case is larval, um, larval recruitment or larvae. So we can tailor this model um, to suit different species needs. So for example, we can change the age at which maturity happens. And we can also add sex change if needed as well and the contribution of males to the population too. We can also include things such as density dependent survival. So this is where the survival of larvae depend, can depend on the um, number of older age classes, or it can actually depend on its own cohort when you've got competition between larvae, for example. So this is sort of the base model that we have. Then we take this model and we put it into a metapopulation model. So we connect all these individual populations um, somehow. And in this particular case, we're connecting them through um, dispersive larvae. So we assume that the adults stay within their population over, over their lifetime. And then when we, because it's a reserve model, we need to implement the reserve. And when we do this, the fishing effort that was in those areas and now is now redistributed to the areas that remain open. And that's called fishery squeeze. So using this metapopulation model structure that we have, um, we parameterized it for kelp bats, and then we included a periodic larval function that's based on those significant peaks that we saw in the spectral analysis. So this is what our function looks like. So we've got recruitment over time, sometime before the reserve is established and sometime after the reserve is established. And because we've included noise um, or randomness into the model, um, we've got heaps of in, and done heaps of runs of it. Each individual run, which is the, the smaller light line, they're all slightly different. So the thick line just represents the mean and standard deviations across all the um, uh, across all the different uh, simulations. So we considered two recruitment scenarios that represent extremes. The first one is when you have bad recruitment occurring at the time that the reserve is established. So this reflects what we actually saw in the Channel Islands. And then we also considered the other scenario where you have, really, you have a really good recruitment year in the time that the reserve is established. And what we wanted to know is whether these two scenarios have a notable effect on what we can expect to see in the years following the reserve establishment. So, 
to answer this, this is essentially the model density of fish, of older fish within the reserve, and it's relative to the year that the reserve is established. So the key take home message from this is that the expected, oh, I should say that this, the purple line is the good recruitment scenario. So when you have a peak, the time the reserve was established and the yellow is the bad recruitment scenario. So the key take home from this is that the expected trajectory that happens in the first two years after the reserve is established can depend on whether it was a good year or whether it was a bad year. And they can be notably different. So importantly, the poor recruitment, um, when poor recruitment coincides with establishing reserves, um, you tend to see delays in population rebuilding. So I'm just going to look at this bad recruitment scenario for a moment. <clears throat> so if we take that scenario and we plot the trajectories inside the reserve, which is what you've already seen, so in this case they're just yellow instead of green, um, oh sorry, instead of green instead of orange now. So if you plot those inside the reserve versus densities outside the reserve, um, we can see that a portion of the simulations tend to overlap um, between inside and outside. And this means that even though the reserve might be doing its job, there is a possibility that it might not actually be able to detect it um, when you're going out and monitoring and when you're comparing inside to outside. Likewise, if you compare inside the reserve to when the reserve was established. So look at where the lines cross the dotted line here. Um, we can see that densities might not always be greater after than they are before or at the time it was established. So there's a way to quantify this effect and it's called detectionability. And essentially detectionability, um, we calculate using something called the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve complicated and it comes from engineering essentially, but what it really tells you is it gives you a measure of how likely you are to, to correctly detect that you do actually, that, um, to the, how likely you are to correctly detect that there is actually an increase happening inside the reserve population based on whether you measure inside, outside or before, after. So um, this is what we did. We used these receiver operator characteristics um, and we looked at this under the scenario of good recruitment and under the scenario of bad recruitment um, at the time the reserve is implemented. So the way to look at this is that if your detection ability is one, um, you've got a sure thing of being able to detect that the reserves um, are doing their job. If it's 0.5, then it's a 50-50 chance. So it's the same as flipping a coin. Um, you might be able to detect it, but you might not be able to. So when we looked at this detection ability across different sampling designs, so whether you sampled inside or outside at the same time, or whether you detect you sampled the population before the reserve was established versus sampling the same population after, or whether you did a mix of the two, before, after, outside, inside, which is analogous to the kind of gold standard BACI design um, that you probably have learned about in, in survey and sampling techniques. So when we look at the detection ability across these sampling designs, um, oh, I should also mention that we look at it in the years following the reserve being established. So these are younger years, so the reserve is younger, this is when the reserve is older. So the key take home from this is that when, um, is that one, what larval recruitment was doing at the time that the reserve is established, two, when the assessment happened, so in the years, what year after the reserve was established, and three, what metric you're comparing um, are all important in um, the likelihood that you're going to detect the positive reserve effect. And this has implications for monitoring design because even if you're using this gold standard BACI design, but say you're only sampling every three years or every five years, you might end up sampling in periods of low detectability um, or periods of high detectability. Just depends on what's happening in the system. And likewise, a before and after design might not always be better than an inside outside design, especially if the reserve um, was established during a period of poor recruitment. So the general implications from this is that when recruitment is highly cyclical, when we see these periodic recruitment pulses, timing of management actions matter, or more so what the, what the pulses were doing at the time the management action happened is important. 
And variability also needs to be accounted for when we're setting, um, setting the expectations. So if we have poor recruitment, need to accept that it might take time for the reserves to actually show their benefits. Um, and likewise, we need to consider that this when performing assessments. So I want you all to take a breather. And I'm going to take a drink of water. And let your brain just kind of switch off from what I've talked about um, and switch on to something different because we're going to be talking about a different aspect of reserve um, for the remainder of the talk. Okay. So a very brief history of MPA. A decade or so um, more ago, when MPAs were really picking up steam, they were approached from two different angles, um, although these different approaches are definitely linked. On one hand, we were more concerned about the roles of MPAs with regards to sustainable fisheries management. So that is providing areas where targeted species can rebuild populations. Um, and benefit both those populations as well as the fishery, potentially benefit the fishery. On the other hand, um, we were approaching things from an ecosystem and biodiversity conservation approach. So putting aside areas where natural states can be rebuilt or maintained. And while we definitely still think about reserves in these two ways, um, we've moved on to a more integrated approach with the goal of long-term conservation with nature um, and with associated ecosystem and cultural services. So looking at the system as an integrative thing and how it can help benefit all aspects um, of communities and species that, that it impacts. And the major question that's sort of being asked now that relates to these goals is what are the roles that MPA face in, um, may play in the face of climate change? And as Robert Sedell pointed out, all these, role, um, these roles are potentially complex, they're nuanced, and they're multifaceted. And the small piece of the puzzle that I'm looking at today and that I think about has to do with the essential tenant that marine reserves rebuild populations um, and how this function could help support fisheries and exploited species um, as climate stresses increase. And the specific thing that I think about is um, extreme environmental disturbances. So let's explore this a bit more. Um, and I'm going to take you halfway around the world and show you some really pretty pictures of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so like I mentioned, this is where I did my PhD. Um, and just a little bit of background on it. So the GBR or Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Uh, in the 80s, there were some small reserves scattered along the coast. But in 2004, we completely rezoned the whole Great Barrier Reef. And now 33% of the area is within MPAs. Um, and the green uh, sludges are the no-take reserves, or practically no-take reserves. The important thing to know about this system is that it does face a number of different disturbances. So we get tropical cyclones, um, we get coral bleaching from um, uh, increased water events, we get crown of Spawn starfish, which just completely decimate the coral. They're voracious coral eaters. And we get flood plumes, um, which bring not only sediment out to the reef, but also um, nutrients and runoff from the farms and um, other industries on the coast. And all of these, they are individual events, but they certainly have impact synergistically. So the fish that we look at um, on the Great Barrier Reef with the Sex Marine Reserve is coral trout. So it is a major fishery, both commercially and recreationally. Um, and it's managed as a single species fishery or more a single genus fishery because there's a couple of different species. Um, and it's managed both with catch quotas as well as spatially managed through MPAs or MPAs affect um, coral trout management. So the important thing about coral trout is that their densities track coral cover. So when we see a decline in coral cover due to major disturbances, such as bleaching events or flooding events, um, we see declines in the uh, biomass of coral trout. So the question is, how could MPAs or how could marine reserves play a role in the face of these disturbances? And to answer this, we need to take a step back and think about the system without um, reserves. 
So we know that fishing increases variability. Um, we've seen that the variation of populations over time. So when I talk about the variations of populations over time, I'm talking about bouncing up and down um, and how, how far they bounce and how much. Um, so we've seen that this is higher for exploited species compared to unexploited species in the same area. And the reason for this is that fishing truncates the age structure. So what this means is it pushes the age structure down towards smaller um, age classes or size classes. And this causes the population to be more sensitive to fluctuations um, in the younger age classes, as well as decreases the reproductive ability of the population, which is important for rebuilding after a population has been knocked down. Um, and all of this increases the chance of collapse as well. So the chance that a population or fishery might um, either go extinct or be no longer viable. Mm -hmm. Bringing reserves into the picture, they're essentially areas that allow for rebuilding. So they're areas that allow the age structure to be restored. Um, and they also are areas where we see increased biomass and reproductive output. So the logical question is, do these areas buffer against disturbance and then reduce variability? And the reason that this might not be so intuitive is that fishing increases variability, um, is, that, is because of reallocated fishing, sorry. Um, essentially, reallocated fishing is when the fish effort, fishing effort that's in the areas that was um, or that is going to become a reserve gets reallocated into the areas that's left open for fishing. And we, we definitely saw this on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so when we reallocate fishing, it means that effort is increased in those areas, biomass decreases, and there's a further truncation of the age structure. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, is there trade-offs between the potential benefits within reserves against the potential negative consequences of reallocating fishing outside when you establish a reserve. So to answer this question, can reserves reduce variability? Um, we used our generic model that we introduced earlier and we um, parameterized it for coral trout. And then we ran it to equilibrium in this case. And the way we implemented disturbance was that when a disturbance event happened, the, the, the chance of adult survival decreased. Um, yeah, so can reserve networks reduce variability is the question we're asking. And yes, they can. So when we ran this baseline model, we found that reserves do reduce variability in the system. So what you're looking at here is the coefficient of variation in biomass. So this is an indication of how much the population bounces around over time. So when you're increasing the CV um, biomass, you, it means there's more variability in the system. And we looked at the chance, uh, we looked at whether this, hmm, yeah. we looked at this over a range of disturbance chances. So 2.2 means there's a 20% chance that a disturbance is gonna happen in a given year. And we looked at it over a range of reserve coverages. So black is no reserve. And then as you go through to the orange, you're increasing the reserve coverage. And you can see as you increase the reserve coverage, you decrease the CV, which means you're getting less variability in the system. And then we also looked at what this meant for extinction probability. So, um, and we get the same sort of result. As you increase the reserve coverage, the probability that your population is going to go extinct decreases. So this is a model, like a really simplic, simplistic model looking at the case where we have no spatial variation in habitat and we have no spatial variation in connectivity. But we know that both of these things matter for the great, for coral trout and for the Great Barrier Reef in particular. So then we ask the question of does placement matter? It doesn't matter where we put the reserves in this spatially heterogeneous system. And to do this, we look, we parameterize the model for an area called the Keppel Islands, which is in the south end of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and we included connectivity through larval, um, real, we included realized connectivity for larval dispersal for coral trout. So we know that this area is more likely, the inshore reefs are more likely to be affected. So this is the Australian coastline and generally disturbance 
tend to come from this area, this site in this particular area. And we know that these disturbances happen on average around every five years. Well, back in 2016, these happened in those five years or so. So we looked at a couple of scenarios for this. We looked at the case where there's no reserve. And then we looked at the case of what happens if we put um, reserves in areas that are more impacted. So this might be the question that um, you ask, okay, well, do I wanna protect areas, try and give areas that are more impacted a better leg up? And then we also ask the question of, okay, what if I actually wanna protect those more pristine or less impacted areas with reserves? And then we also looked at a mixed scenario where half your reserves are protecting impacted reefs and half your reserves are protecting um, uh, not impacted reefs or populations. So I should say that a reef, when I say a reef, I mean a population. Okay, so there's some complicated results that came out of this model and I'm just gonna talk through the figure a little bit, but hopefully it doesn't go completely over your head in a very short time frame of presenting the results. So what we're looking at here is the change in the coefficient of variation of biomass and the change in the coefficient of variation of total yield, yield with reserve. So we're saying when we establish a reserve, how much does that bouncing around change? And if you're below the dotted line, it means there's less variability, so that's a good thing. If you're above the dotted line, it means there's more variability, so that's a bad thing. Um, and we looked at this for a heavily fish system. So what happens if the fishery is um, pretty much exploited before reserves are established and a moderately fish system, so when it's more sustainably managed. And we looked at it over a couple of reserve placement scenarios. So on the far left, it represents areas where the reserves are more centrally located um, within the meta population, and then areas where the reserves are more isolated within the meta population. Okay, and then we looked across our couple of disturbance scenarios. So first of all, if we were to replace place reserves only in impacted reefs, um, this would actually increase the variability to the total meta population biomass, but it would decrease the variability of yield if the fishery is moderately fished and sort of has a bit of a middle of the run effect um, for more heavily fished systems. Conversely, if we protect only um, the non-disturbed areas for so the non-impacted reefs, this is generally a good thing. Well, it is a good thing for biomass. Great thing if the fishery is heavily exploited, but it can actually increase the variability if the fishery is um, well managed and sustainable. But if we do a mix of the both, so if we protect disturbed and non-disturbed areas, then uh, we kind of get you know, a bit of an average effect, which is not really surprising. Um, but in general, it sort of benefits everyone. So it means that your biomass becomes more stable or less variable. Your yields tend to become less variable. The only caveat to this is if you tend to have isolated um, reserves, so they're reserved out on the periphery of the meta population, um, then it can actually be detrimental to put reserves in. Um, well, it can increase variability with reserves, I should say, compared to a no reserve scenario. So the general implications from this sort of um, study that we found were that there can be nuanced effects of reserves. So this is moving beyond the idea of biomass, so just measuring abundances and abundance changes. And it shows that reserves have the potential to reduce variability um, and increase persistence, uh, even if they don't increase yield, which is an important point. But the caveat and the thing to think about is that reserve placement and how the different populations are connected and where the reserves are placed with respect to impact is really, really important. So if you wanna benefit both biomass and yield, so you want both conservation and fisheries benefits, then the best thing to do is protect a mix of disturbed and non-disturbed areas. Um, and the other thing to note is that those poorly connected reserves can actually be quite detrimental. So this, um, this study that we did was based on a long-term equilibrium condition. So it assumes, so we ran the model all the way out for a long time, essentially. And what it does is it assumes that reserves have fully rebuilt fish populations. And this um, is a really important point because we know that it actually takes a while for the benefits of reserves to be felt. 
So it can take years to decades um, for biomass and for yield, um, for biomass to fully recover and for yield benefits to be realized. Um, and these timelines vary depending on life history traits and they vary depending on the history of the fishery as well, as well as how the fishery is reallocated. The important thing too is it also takes similar time frames to rebuild the aid structure. As we talked about earlier, that aid structure is really important in how the reserve is going to respond to the services. So consequently, it would, we can then ask the question of, okay, well, how long will it take for these resilience benefits, this decreased variability to actually build up? And I'll talk a little bit what, by what I mean about resilience in a moment, um, because I know that it, it's a term that can kind of be used in many different ways. So to answer this question of how long will it take, um, we're gonna come back to California because this is work that I'm working on now. And um, we've parameterized this general metapopulation model to suit blue rockfish in this case. So I'm gonna go through a little toy simulation um, of what is happening in this model and hopefully this works. Had a little glitches yesterday, but we'll see. Okay, so cool. We have some sort of fish metapopulation that's plotting along in time. And then we establish a reserve that protects a portion of that metapopulation. After that happens, generally in the absence of any disturbance or stochasticity, this metapopulation will increase. And that's our no disturbance baseline scenario. We then look at the scenario where the population um, is plodding along and then at some point after the reserve has been established, the population experiences some sort of disturbance. Um, and this disturbance can affect either, we've got two scenarios, it can affect either the adult survival, so when a disturbance happens, the adult survival reduces, or it can affect the juveniles. So when disturbance happens, the juvenile survival decreases. And the, ten, the intensity of the disturbance dictates how much the survival of either of these is affected. So the disturbance can last a number of years, and we call that the length of the disturbance after which point the population, there's no more disturbance and the population recovers. So um, in this case, we're just looking at single disturbance events. So to measure resilience, we've taken the engineering approach or engineering definition of resilience. And this is broken down into two parts. Resistance, uh, which is the total percentage decrease or decline that the meta population experiences during the disturbance. Uh, and then recovery, which is the time it takes um, for the meta population to recover back to its pre disturbance levels. And this is from the end of the disturbance. So, this is sort of really essentially what we did for the coral trout model, but instead of measuring resistance and recovery explicitly, we were just looking at how much this causes bouncing around. So, then we considered a um, couple of different scenarios where we first of all varied the intensity and then where we also varied the length of the disturbance. So that's, that's the general gist of how the model ran. So these are quite preliminary results, hence the question mark. Um, so please don't go sharing these on Twitter um, or also um, don't take them as gospel truth yet. So in the interest of time, I'm only gonna present the results from the scenarios where we varied the length of disturbance. Um, although the general trends are the same for where we varied the intensity of the disturbance. So here you're looking at the recovery, so how quickly the population recovers and the resistance, how much the population size is reduced during the disturbance. Um, and you're looking at how these vary as the reserve gets older. So the key things to take away from this is first of all, that the um, that resilience so the recovery and the resistance increases rapidly in the first five years of the reserve being established. Um, and the, the lower, I should say, the lower the recovery time, the, um, the better it is. Secondly, after about 10 years, the resilience capacity somewhat stabilizes and it's no longer dependent on the age of the reserve. So this is what happened when we had disturbance affecting juveniles. Um, and then if we have disturbance affecting adults, we sort of see a really similar result. The only difference is that the recovery times are longer and more dependent on the length of the disturbance. So like I said, this is preliminary work, it's to be continued. 
but the main implications from it is that it will help set more realistic goals around the capacities of MPAs. Um, and it will also possibly help um, highlight some cryptic conservation goals. So what I mean by this is that we may find that reserves do not produce noticeably greater fish abundances under certain climate regimes, but they may still be able to drive resilience benefits against disturbances. They're just harder to see and harder to detect. An important note is that we found there was roughly five years for resilience benefits to build up, but the generation time for blue rock fish is six years. So we need to ask the question of whether this is sensitive to age maturity or fishing pressure. Um, essentially, is it sensitive to all those things that we already know um, affect the short-term dynamics of reserves? So while we work forward on this, if you're really interested in the resilience um, and fishing and protection and age maturity sort of questions, I really suggest you keep an eye out for Karen Barcello's work. She is a lab colleague. Uh, and she's doing some really interesting stuff in this space. And her work is far more advanced along than this. Um, so keep an eye out for when that work gets published. It, it'll be really good. Cool. So last slide, key take home. The thing that I would really like you to take home from this is first of all, that marine reserves can play important but subtle roles with respect to environmental disturbances. Um, they can benefit both fish populations and yield. But the caveats are that resilience effects can take time to develop. Um, and we need to keep this in mind. Um, and all of this sort of has that implication of moving beyond the biomass effects of reserves and looking at other aspects of them uh, in the context of single populations. MPA location and connectivity is really important. So um, protecting across a range of disturbance likelihood or protecting areas that are subject to a range of disturbance likelihood is really good. Um, it's going to give you the best trade off between conservation and fishery values. Uh, and having well connected reserves is also really beneficial in the context of disturbances. Um, and this just builds on the, the general premise that we know that connectivity is really, really important in reserves. This is just another aspect of it. And lastly, um, the timing of assessment and the monitoring. So, when, we, when and how we do these things is going to influence the response that we see and we need to keep this in mind. So temporal variability may slow um, expected responses. So this was, you know, when you establish a reserve at the time when there's a poor larval recruitment, um, then you're probably going to see slower responses or you will see slower responses than if it's a, a really good year for larval recruitment. And we need to think about this. We need to account for this variability in monitoring the design and in setting expectations. So if there's any questions that I don't answer today, we want to know more, feel free to send me an email um, with my Twitter handle. And also I just want to end on saying this is obviously not just the work that I've done on my own. It's work of many collaborative and inspirational minds. So thank you to everyone who um, helped contribute and is continuing to contribute to this work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jess. I really appreciate it. Um, for folks that are online, go ahead and put any of your questions into the chat box. Um, you're getting just a whole lot of basically clapping. Uh, great job. Uh, yay. Uh, those kind of things coming in right now. So uh, just know that we appreciate you and that that's coming in, even though you can't hear them. Um, as people get a chance to ask their questions, I had a question for you. It seems like um, the core of this work was based on some modeling work um, around the, the coral trout and that you did some extrapolations for our coast. And it seemed like um, age at maturity was one of those factors that um, might influence the outcome of these. Were there other factors that you might think of as you try to apply it to other systems that you might talk to about? And forgive me, it is hailing like crazy here. So if you are hearing that, that is what's in the background. Forgive me so much. <laughs> Um, so I've only been working in the, in the California coast or West Coast um, system for a couple of months, so I'm certainly not as um, familiar with it. But the couple of things that I've really noticed is that, first of all, the Great Barrier Reef, and feel free anyone to jump in and correct me if, if um, I'm getting this wrong, but the GBR seems to really have just coral trout and a couple of other snapper species. So it really is single species heavy, um, focused fisheries. Whereas the West Coast seems to be more um, kind of, a, the fishery affects more species. So we really do need to think more about that sort of age at maturity question 
um, the fishing history questions. So how heavily the fish um, were fished prior to the reserves being established and um, what happens to that, that, um, that fishing effort when we establish a reserve. So those things are really, really important. I think you're gonna have huge effects. Um, and also potentially where that fishing effort is redistributed. So what areas does it go to? Because this spatial heterogeneity mix between um, where disturbances happen and where fishing pressure happens and where things are protected, it, it all has this complex interplay um, and obviously has a, is also influenced by the connectivity, um, whether it's larval connectivity or adult movement. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, that those are sort of the things we are really thinking about that are really different between the two systems. All right, um, so we've got a question here about detection um, probability figure from part one. Um, can you comment on the BACI design? Yep. So I don't know yeah, if you I'm want reading to go back the question. Okay. Surprisingly good detection probability even um, when established after low recruitment period. Okay, so I think, um, yeah, so I think the reason that we have the good detection probability in the BACI design is because it's, um, so if you remember when we had the inside outside, there was a really big difference between um, the, whether it was a good year or a bad year for larvae. And that was because you're comparing one point in time after to that low, or high point when the reserve was established. The backy design, which is what it's meant to do, um, takes into account, it also includes the fished population as well. So it takes into account what both populations are doing um, in time, but also takes into account the fact that reserves are building up compared to what they were before. So um, I hope that answers your question, Tom, if that's where you were going with it. Um, great. Uh, what are your thoughts and similarities and differences on your approach and study methods and findings to the ones compared to the marine protected areas and wildlife protected areas on land? Oh, good question. I am a marine biologist, <laughs> so I can't comment too much on terrestrial stuff. Um, the only other system I've worked in is freshwater. Similarities and differences on your approach study methods. <laughs> good point, Michael. Um, Michael says, so are we. With wildlife protected areas on land? I honestly don't know. I mean, connectivity on land is certainly very important. Um, it's a bit different to connectivity in the ocean. So, yeah, I, I'm stumped on that one. I can't really. I think the approach could still be applied. It would just have to obviously have very different consequences given the different demography and ecology um, and spatial structure of what populations and wildlife on land go through. Nice. Um, any other questions from folks online while we have a little time? Uh, feel free to put it into the chat box. Um, for you, Jess, I just uh, want to take a second to just say thank you so much. Um, I had really hoped that you would be here at some point and we could do this in person and, and you could be a part of us um, here at Hatfield. But I'm really glad that you were able to join from afar and still share your work with us and um, hopefully feel a little bit more connected to us at Hatfield. So thank you so much for your time today. No worry. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Um, again, I think that uh, if anybody else has further questions and you want to reach out to Jess directly, um, she has her contact information up on the screen. So you're welcome to do that. Um, and other than that, uh, everybody uh, have a good holiday and we will see you in two weeks on December 3rd um, for our next uh, seminar. So thanks, everyone. And again, Jess, thanks so much. Appreciate it. No worries. All right, lots of clapping again coming in. Thank you, thank you. Brilliant work. <laughs> thanks for sharing all that good stuff. So thanks, everybody. I'll just let those roll just a little bit. Okay, everybody, yeah, thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> all right, Jess, I'm going to go ahead and end it for everybody. Cool, great. <laughs> thanks. thanks, Cinnamon. All right. <laughs> Bye.